and we're bringing in speakers at lunch, we're having cocktails at night, and we're talking a lot about what about this is affecting us as leaders and what are we going to take back and try to focus upon change, what's really motivating us. And it's companies like State Street, Boston Consulting, Unilever, AT&T, so big companies that can make a real difference. And by the way, we have an Anderson graduate in the, in the cohort, so he sends his best. He may join me tomorrow if he has capacity. So anyway, I'll sign off now. Uh, have a great panel discussion, and thanks again for all you're doing. I think it's real leadership. We're thinking of the next at Anderson. Thanks, Professor Sangle. We appreciate it. So, okay, ciao. Um, I want to start off with uh, a question that actually the uh, moderator had mentioned at the end of the, the talk with Elon there. And that is that many try to bring this marriage of technology and economics together. And um, some do okay at it, some fail. And I can't think of anybody that does it as well as, as Elon does. Why do you think that is? Um, and this is an audience of, of future leaders and, and business students and other and, and people from other departments. What kind of what could you take out of that? And what could you give this audience there? Anyone there? I'm happy to start. I think you heard a couple of things um, already from um, from that discussion with Elon. Also, um, a professor just spoke about the things that make Elon unique. This idea of breaking down the problem to its fundamental core and then building up the logic from that. Uh, there are a couple of things that I might add. Um, Elon was at Anderson uh, at least seven years ago, so that's not right, and, uh, and spoke to, uh, to a group here. And one of the things that I remember taking away from that was that he slept at his office under his <laughs> desk <laughs> when he first got started with PayPal. I mean, the guy is like relentlessly focused on achieving his vision, and the vision is incredibly large. And, and you know what I think is something that defines people who are after a vision this large um, is that there's you know you don't always have to have faith in the solution if you have enough faith in the problem. And if you look at the energy crisis that the planet faces, it's a trillion dollar problem. Right? We're going to have to solve that problem as a civilization if we're going to continue. And if you believe that believe that people will be out there thinking that and capital will follow, opportunity will follow from all of that. So you just have to chase that vision and be relentless in your pursuit of it. And when you build your internal um, uh, projects, have the uh, internal logic to, to stay focused towards, uh, towards the vision. I think the thing I would point out about Elon's choice of products is that every single one of them, clean vehicles, um, renewable energy technologies, rockets, are, they all embody values that collectively we're trying to advance. And that actually our government um, makes R&D investments in, as an expression of our desire um, to develop these new technologies because of the, the social benefits they provide. He's not producing a new, new type of potato chip or a new type of cell phone. He's producing technologies that are core to our future values and, um, and, there, and, and he's, he's, I would point out that every single technology has behind it a portfolio of public policies that support the research, development, and adoption of those technologies. And so he's thought very carefully about the, collectively, how his, product is, is gonna, his products are gonna be seen and valued by us. And, and if you think about um, why it is that, that we want those, it's not just because we care about the environment, um, and uh, we want cool new technology, or we want to be able to travel to whatever planet we prefer. Um, but it, it's because as consumers, if he succeeds, and other entrepreneurs in these areas succeed, we'll each have, we'll have, we'll have a new set of choices as consumers that, that will themselves be liberating it relative to the ones we currently have. So there are a set of, I think, values that are embodied in the, in the, the promises of technology and that are embraced collectively. And I think that's a very smart uh, strategy to sort of build your technologies into long, um, well-supported public initiatives. See, um, I, last summer I worked at Tesla as an intern, so I'd like to share just a small story in terms of who is Elon Musk in terms of the day-to-day -day 
not at the end of the day because he, he, he was at the whole day um, all week, just twice a week because he also had to go to outer space and he had to also <laughs> and see the, the sun also, right? So uh, basically that was my first week over there. I was updating a board, a chart, and I just like get a tap. Hey, what's up, mate? What are you doing? <laughs> so basically I looked at him. He's a pretty tall guy like me. And uh, I didn't know what to do. If I asked for an autograph, or <laughs> a picture, give him a kiss, work harder, work harder. <laughs> but I explained what I was doing to him. So um, basically, uh, that's Elon Musk. He's present. His day-to-day -day present when he's at Tesla, he's, he goes to the factory floor. I did my internship at the, at the, the floor, at the, the assembly line. So he was present. Everybody saw him. He, every 15, 20 days, he was giving a speech. So uh, he was addressing the need to grow, the need, the importance of that technology to not only to the workers, but to the whole uh, change of, of paradigm and to, to moving forward. Um, as a new technology. So I say, basically, uh, he didn't know how to answer his own question, now we have to answer his, his, his question, but basically, he's a very present guy. Second, he, uh, like uh, the professor that works at, at, at TED now, that, uh, he is passionate, he loves cars. Third, he put together the best team uh, together. So he brought people from the best factories in the world, Toyota, Honda, uh, Jaguar, uh, Ford, GM, all of the head of the main areas at Tesla or the best people in the world working. So at Tesla, I didn't feel bad about my accent because there were <laughs> accents all over the place, Canadian, European, uh, Spanish, so I felt pretty comfortable over there talking. And, and also, He's a very detail-oriented guy. Um, I, uh, there was, uh, we, we started the, I, I know I, I talk a little much, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there was this very interesting well, story. <laughs> there was this very interesting story that we, I started over there the first week of the launch of the Model S. Oh, wow. So when started the production, the 100 cars, uh, everybody was thinking, oh great, the, the clients are happy, everybody's running around with those cars, fantastic. But basically they were in our warehouse, the back of the factory. That, they, they didn't go to the clients. Why? Because Elon Musk was individually looking at each car to inspect each detail, each problem that each car had. Wow. That sends a very important message to the old company that look, you should pay attention. Even people that work 20, 30 years in the business, it, it send a message, look, I am getting things that you guys are gonna get. So pay attention, detail oriented, have a passion, be focused, is what I saw over there during my three months over there. It grew the ball, it's leadership. Oh, it'd be really stressful to be working uh, under, under a guy <laughs> tapping you on the social shoulder as CEO. Yeah, the first week, right? Wow, that's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so, Let's stick on EV since since we have a panel that's that's kind of um, it's, it's, that's their profession really is um, mass adoption here. You know, always people are talking about it's not happening fast enough, or you know, it's out there and it will happen. Um, what are some of the big challenges you guys see for mass adoption of EVs, and um, how are, how can we get over some of those hurdles? Big loaded question. Well, I, I'm happy to start with that one. Um, you know, two years ago, if we were up here, the first word out of anyone's mouth would be range anxiety. But if you look at the share of electric vehicles sold today, um, over 65, 70% of them have a combustion engine along with the battery. So we have these plug-in electric hybrids in addition to the battery electric hybrids. So to, 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 to answer your question, I think the automakers themselves are thinking hard about this problem or asking what do consumers need what kind of flexibility and resiliency do they want in their, their vehicle? And they're giving it to it. And that's gonna help the market expand. That's gonna assist with adoption. Um, I, I think that if you compare the rate of adoption of electric vehicles to that of early hybrids, at least over the first two to three years, electric vehicles on an hybrid are outpacing the hybrids. Um, but it's important, and a colleague of mine at the Luskin Center has written on this, to, to, to manage our expectations and then set them realistically. 
These are new technologies. And one of the greatest challenges with new technologies is not that the producers have to figure out how to produce them cost effectively, but consumers have to learn about them. They have to come to trust them. They have to become comfortable using them. And, and that's going to take time. That's going to take years. Um, I don't actually think, despite um, the importance of um, infrastructure and electric charging equipment, I don't actually think that's the greatest barrier at the moment. I think it's really consumer education and comfort. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. I would say that, um, that the role that we're playing uh, as a company in building infrastructure is going to be key to getting to the next stage. While the cars are practical and available today for everyone, figuring out how to get into that next stage of the market is also going to mean figuring out how to get people a place to plug in. Not everyone has a reliable place to park their car every day. Um, it's really critical. For example, I'm, I'm uh, the, uh, in my night job, I'm the mayor pro tem in the city of Santa Monica. And here's a city you would say, by all accounts, is an early adopter market, right? It's, uh, it's flat, it's uh, dense, it has a great climate, it's progressive, it's more affluent. And yet, 70% of us are renters. <coughs> Some 10% to 15% more are in condos. So multifamily housing is a really important conundrum when uh, a lot of those folks, first of all, don't have a place that they consistently park their car. Many of them are parking on the street. Uh, and secondly, uh, even when they do have a place to park their car, it's, it, it's loaded with sort of old infrastructure. There's no reason to really bring a lot of electricity into a parking garage at, or a parking lot as it is today. So that challenge, I think, it remains a significant one as we begin to think about what the next stage of the marketplace is. Um, the uh, the plug-in hybrid vehicles, which are having great success, as JR mentions, um, are, I think, a transitional uh, technology that gets us to Elon's vision of the full battery electric car. And I'll go to my grave saying that one day will, it will be true. But, um, but the, it, the idea that, you know, I started my first job in uh, my career was in electric vehicle charging uh, with Edison International. And, uh, and we were starting a company distributing chargers uh, uh, all over uh, California and Arizona. And the idea when the Toyota Prius was announced that a hybrid vehicle could be uh, economically viable was so mind-blowing. Like, um, not only is it hard enough to sort of commercialize a car with a different powertrain, but now to do one with two different powertrains was totally amazing. And we saw that same revolution happen, really, with the plug-in hybrid vehicle. Because we said, okay, well, you've got a hybrid, you know, with a battery and a, uh, a gas engine. Why would you spend the extra couple thousand dollars in cost of goods sold to put a charging port and then require the customer to buy a, a plug and potentially upgrade you know their charging situation in their home or at work and that has now happened and there's some reasons why that is starting to happen but I think it it will transition us to the point where we'll sell enough batteries it will drop the cost of the battery EV and people will become uh, will find that plugging in is more convenient than filling up it's lower cost and when they're comfortable with it, we'll, we'll see more battery EVs. And I have, uh, I agree with, with, with this, this, and in addition uh, to the government incentives to having more infrastructure in terms of incentivizing, I think that it's always good to have more, more companies, more Teslas, more Fiskers, more Coda, to incentivize even more and more the, the market. And going into that line, if we have these kind of, of companies, we're not mostly relying on the big OEMs and the big companies, because in theory, they will have all the platform to do it, but they're not doing it. So there's some kind of NX reasons that they're not doing it. So we, we should rely on these other guys to do it to start. So we need to incentivize these companies. And one of the major problems that these companies have as early stage companies it goes back to the production also, to producing these vehicles. So we have uh, a couple of examples like DeLorean and even Tucker mm -hmm. that uh, didn't go well. They, they have disruptive um, 
technology, a, a very innovative corp like our design, but they fail in terms of mass producing the car, producing in, in large scale. And I think that having more competition, more people producing cars, and you getting your production in a, a massive amount like this, these big OEMs will really also help to boost the market. I just wanted to add one thing um, to, to this part of the conversation, which is, you know, I don't know if you all are aware, but there are over, we've, in the last two and a half years, over 70,000 plug-in electric vehicles have been sold. And, and we have twice as many models coming out over the next two years as we currently have, right, which is over a dozen. Um, and, and yet, again, coming back to this question of what are reasonable expectations, right? In any product market, you're gonna have more failures than, than you're gonna have successes. You're gonna have dominant products that succeed and, 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 and you're gonna have losers. And we need to, we need to recognize this. Um, right now, the OEMs have a challenge. They're producing vehicles, you know, there are 10 or, or 12 of them producing vehicles that, um, that, that are just selling more right now than the hybrids were selling back when there were only two companies, you know, Honda and Toyota selling, selling hybrids originally. So their market shares are smaller. Um, there's gonna be consolidation, there's gonna be dropping out, and we, we shouldn't be upset by that. That's a great point, you know, when, um, when we have a huge amount of hype in the EV industry, um, not just a little more than a year ago, and the hype kind of turned towards uh, criticism over the last year, notwithstanding the criticism, I thought it was a good thing to see the hype factor decline because it had gotten to be a little bit too large. And uh, and here we we're talking today about Elon's uh, companies and and what has made him great and and uh, what will make these companies great. And, and while I think that they're great um, and they've had a significant amount of success, he's not through the woods by any stretch, and the auto industry, you know, taking on the global auto industry and, and kind of starting from scratch is one of the most ambitious affairs a person could think of, except for maybe creating a private space company. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's highly capital intensive, and, and you know, one model failure will fail the entire company, and what we have today is uh, the Roadster, which was successful as a, a demonstration vehicle and a platform for the technology. But we're just introducing the Model S. It's winning all the awards you can imagine. But they're still not out of the woods. And, and so, and, and I'm sure Elon would be the first to admit that. So uh, let's switch gears, pun intended, to uh, Solar a little bit. Um, he has a pretty aggressive view of solar. I mean, 18 years, there'll be more power from solar than any other source. I mean, that's. That's out in space. So, I mean, what do you guys, do you guys feel that that is even possible at all? Is it totally the pie in the sky, or if so, why? Or if not, why? Those numbers really were quite a surprise to me. Right. Um, it, it, it's terrifically ambitious. Um, and at EBGO, um, where Howard mentioned I am, we're a subsidiary of NRG Energy, and NRG is now the largest owner and operator of solar power in the United States, maybe in the world. And uh, views the industry um, uh, very aggressively, um, and has put a great deal of capital behind uh, first utility scale solar. And it, I think, you could reasonably say utility scale solar is what is enabling California to meet its renewable portfolio standards. Um, and yet, it is uh, reaching some of its limits. It, uh, it is <coughs> incredibly land intensive. Um, it's water intensive in, in places that don't have water, um, depending on the kind of technology you're using. Um, and more and more, the state, the policy supports, the industry uh, is going towards distributed solar. And what I think Elon um, hit on the head that will enable him, the industry to achieve this vision that he has for it is this duality of, of, of the cost equation, which is material costs uh, that are plunging expected to continue to drop, uh, and so much so that the installation costs are really the entire story of distributed solar. And, um, and figuring out how to get the installation costs out has to date been fairly conventional models. Um, by 
finance strategies, um, more efficient assessment strategies, remote assessments, and, and, and a well-managed contractor base, more or less, to install your solar um, in the distributed way. But with the innovations that are happening in materials, you'll start to see installation costs drop because solar production will happen in ways that are not conventional crystalline solar panels on your roof. They'll become, they'll be integrated materials. They'll be, in, uh, and those material cost reductions and, and innovations will drive reductions in insulation. That's the only way you get to do on solar. But if a country like Germany can pull this off, uh, you know, uh, California and Arizona and the Southwest ought to no doubt be able to do that. And I think if we look to Germany as a sample, what we see in terms of Elon Stoll and the promise of achieving it is a, is a community and a country that's willing to pay for it. Um, you know, in the U.S., tax incentives, tax rebates for the average home solar system could cover as much as 35 to 50 percent of the installation costs right now in terms of avoiding taxes. That's a huge policy support. So it's even more supportive than, than most of us appreciate. Um, I think the financing model that, um, that Solar City employs and other companies employ is an important innovation that has made it available to thousands of households. But it, unless we're collectively willing to do two things, continue to support the, the installation and create pro procurement incentives for households and businesses, we're not gonna get there. And then the other point is the point that Terry made. We haven't even begun with third and fourth generation uh, solar technologies. And the, the um, integrated building solar the, uh, has just tremendous um, cost advantages um, and, and other kinds of advantages. I would, I would point out the other real challenge is on the utility side. You, you know, while, while we as customers think about putting solar on, it's something that also has to be managed by the utility. And every cloudy day that we have, or cloudy afternoon that we have, that utility has to stand ready with extra capacity to meet your needs when you turn the switch on and your solar system isn't operating. So the economic model of the utility has to change. Our rate structures will have to change. And those, those utilities, honestly, they have not changed at all in 60 years, 70 years, since you know, they were given the authority to begin operating as monopolies. And so they've got to adapt in order to enable us to adapt as well. Uh, no, uh, just uh, thinking related to solar panels in cars. I think uh, that's good that you're not oh, thinking yeah. on having that uh, for now. I don't know if you guys, what would you guys think in terms of having so, solar panels in cars? Well, Fisker has it, right? I have one on my car. Let's have oh, yeah? <laughs> I have one on my car. Oh, okay. Well, the Nissan Leaf. Oh, yes, yes. Right. So, that it, but it, it's novel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, and we usually when we go even a park, we, we park in the garage or under a tree, so it's only when you're driving, but it's also. So that, that's, a, that's a good one, it's, it's solar and, and EV, so let's, let's bridge a little gap there. Obviously that little panel on top of your roof you described is more like window dressing, but um, something that Elon is doing and others are con contemplating is maybe putting a, a large solar span across uh, multiple parking stalls that feed into a charger that is dedicated to one stall having um, charging. Now this is very, I don't be Versaline for probably many, uh, you know, uh, eco, eco-friendly folks, it's kind of like the dream, you know, you're driving around in your sports electric vehicle and you pull up to, um, you know, your, your favorite restaurant and you plug into the sun and then you eat your food and drive away and drive off into the sunset. Um, how organic feasible, vegan food. Yeah, organic <laughs> vegan food. <laughs> how, <laughs> how, how, <laughs> how feasible is this economically and both uh, both economically and with the technology that's out there now being the efficiency of the solar panels? Are we there yet? Are we close? So the, 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 the solution that would make your vision happen is a fourth technology we haven't talked about, which is battery technology. Battery, battery technology changes everything in ways that we, we're only beginning to um, that, that solar system on the carport is not going to actually be able to recharge the three or four cars that are parked under it at, at current efficiency levels. But if we develop batteries that allow us to capture um, wind power, which is even cheaper than solar, and solar power, and then use them in our electric transportation, now we've got a formula that's viable. Um, and so I think battery technology is, is actually the one, the one technology. It's not very sexy. 
Um, it's always hidden, but it's incredibly enabling. And we've had tremendous breakthroughs in the last 10 years, and I expect with the, the automakers I'm pushing, we'll see additional breakthroughs. So I, I, I think it's in the future, but it's gonna take a different form than we imagined it. We're investing in uh, fast charging strategies with batteries and um, you know, likely to find ourselves getting into uh, solutions that include the solar canopy like um, Elon is doing with, with Tesla's supercharging stations. And, uh, and they're really expensive. Um, and it's not the solar, it's the structure, really. You have to have, you have to find value in having covered parking. And there is value. I mean, you can find it all over the region, uh, covered parking today. But you have to want to pay for that in order to pay for the system today. Uh, maybe that changes with um, lower cost batteries that maybe um, make the value of the fuel increase because you can produce and store more fuel on site. But today, otherwise, integrating that into the uh, building and ultimately into the grid is sort of the way to begin to create the kinds of economies to make that, that system work. And as JR pointed out, that inherently relies on the utility today. The battery enables you to get away from the utility models, but JR and I collaborated on a similar uh, type of utility problem with Metropolitan Water District, where we spent a great deal of time on this Blue Ribbon Committee talking about the, this uh, inherent death spiral that the utility, uh, in this case MWD, but you can apply it to the um, electric utility sector also, gets into when you have distributed technologies that take volume off of the grid, people use their, or use or create their electricity locally, and the role of the grid or of the wholesaler water supply system is in reliability, and yet pricing so you're paying in kilowatt hours, um, and, uh, and the utility doesn't get value out of your kilowatt hours for providing what is the core of reliability that you still need. That death spiral is, is an incredible uh, social problem, I think, uh, for our economy. Uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A pretty soon. Uh, just one last question I want to throw out to you guys, more of a, a fun one. Um, a lot of EV technology, a lot of solar technology moving very rapidly. What excites you right now? I mean, is, is it in either EV, solar, or wind? Throw out your favorite technology that's going to change the world here. Um, besides the new iPad Mini, I guess. <laughs> 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 your favorite technology that will change the world, huh? Oh, you could you could limit it to the to the three companies. If one of your favorites of the three companies. Oh. Uh, Well, look, I've dedicated um, most of my career to EVs. I do think that the game has changed for EVs this time around, and I think in a meaningful way that, um, that uh, you know, when you look at the problem of global warming, one of the stickiest uh, or, or stingiest sources of emissions is the transportation sector, and personal transportation in particular. And here we're at the precipice of this opportunity to really drive reductions in global warming emissions from that sector, perhaps uh, more opportunity potentially than any other sector as a result. And when I was in this industry in the 90s and, and watched it dissolve um, in the 2000s, uh, the dynamics were different. And a lot of folks ask me, you know, is the technology different? And frankly, not that much. I mean, batteries are cheaper, sure, uh, they're still too expensive versus what we need for mass market adoption. Um, but the real technology that was different is your phone. You know, we used to um, print books. I, I had a rental car company that I founded. We used to print binders to find charging stations. And, you know, we sent people, new renters off uh, with nothing more than, you know, a, a loose leaf binder and hope that nobody's going <laughs> to be parked at their charging station when they get there. Today, that's all on your phone. And, you know, you can know real time if somebody's parked and, and plugged into the charging station that you intend to use. All of that's changed. You add um, that, you know, there's national policy supports. Uh, this time around, look, California was really the only game last time. Um, the rise of China makes it all, all that much more important um, <laughs> for the globe uh, to solve this personal transportation problem. And, uh, and real capital has gotten in, involved and invested in it this time. You know, we used to read reports of the growth of the EV industry from electric and, and 
Edison Electric Institute and EPRI and all these sort of industry electric industry groups. Now we read them from Boston Consulting Group and, and Deutsche Bank and, and names uh, you know and used to trust. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so for me, you know, I, I'm very much in this industry, and it's it, it's uh, it's back to my future. <laughs> so, I, you know, one of Elon's rivals, um, I think, is makes a beautiful car, the Carmen Disco. I mean, that if you want to know what excites me, then you know, there, there you are. But I think, from a, from a social point of view, um, actually, it's the other end of the car market. Um, that where EVs really hold the promise of, of advancing um, and doing real social good. Uh, you know, a, a Honda Civic version of an electric vehicle that, that, that costs eight, nine, ten thousand dollars twelve thousand dollars and is, is environmentally friendly, meets the needs of, of, of families everywhere around the world. That's, that's the promise of electric vehicles, and I think we will get there. Um, I, I think there's some actually advantage to starting at the high end with the with with um, with Tesla and, and 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 other vehicles, but I think in terms of you know what's going to really lead to mass adoption, your earlier question, it's it's those vehicles, and we're starting to see those show up, and we're starting to see people become familiar and, and comfortable with them. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm going to go with you guys also with Tesla because that's also I'm unemployed, right? <laughs> so uh, I have to <laughs> I have to to go with Tesla, but the thing is. I think that coming together with with the uh, the new electric vehicle will come new technologies in terms of different things that we're going to find inside cars. So one of the things that have is a fantastic feature in my humble point of view is it's a 17 inch television. It's not just a piece of television in the middle of the dashboard. That's fantastic. Um, and other things that Tesla is thinking, like for instance, getting rid of the side mirrors. And etc. So, these kind of technologies that we're not even thinking on 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 ha what will happen now could happen in the future. That could really drive also technology inside of a car to 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 areas beyond that what we at customer interfaces exactly. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So. And to underscore that point, it's not not even technology inside the car, but actually inside the home. Uh, I mean, when you buy an EV. seriously about their energy consumption in their home and really in their life, right? And so what that means is it's, a, it's disruptive um, in, in the home because, you know, you've just essentially doubled your consumption of electricity at home. So now I start to think, okay, what does that mean for my rates? Am I on the right utility rate? Am I, do I have technology in the home that can help me to manage my electricity to be more efficient, more cost efficient? And then you start to think, where is my electricity coming from? Do I have solar panels or do I have a house? So it starts to create this whole virtuous loop uh, in the home with the consumer. And, uh, and, and I think that's why it has so much promise. Great. All right, let's open it up to the audience for Q&A. Do we have any questions? Okay. Great panel discussion, Dylan. Um, so the theme here has been technology insertion, market-driven, Convergence on all these things, but I think a lot of you guys have pointed to the challenges with public policy. And we can talk about public policy, but how do you overcome the public awareness and the coefficient of friction with respect to the politics of public policy? And how do you get that side of the stakeholder community to really enlarge it and really increase the public awareness? You talked about the internalization of your home's consumption. How do you get that so that you're no longer worried about your early adopters but when you go throughout the rest of the market. Well, this is, uh, you know, this is a great challenge of our time in, in a sense. I mean, uh, we spent a good deal of time last night uh, on our, at our city council meeting in Santa Monica talking about sustainability and we set goals to reduce our emissions in our entire community in Santa Monica by 15% uh, below 1990 levels uh, by 2015. So, important new ambitious goals and somebody commented at the meeting I thought it was kind of an, uh, amazing that uh, it was refreshing to be a part of a, a community and a discussion where people regarded facts as important 
<laughs> which is not the case in the federal debate today on these same issues. And, and so I think that's kind of the crux of, of, of the question. Um, the reality, it, you know, we can only deny reality for so long. And I think that uh, the, the policy is going to follow as, um, as, we, as reality confronts us more directly on our daily lives. Uh, and, and so I think you bet on the long term on that. Uh, it's the only way to get yourself up in the morning, too. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, you know, keep in mind, too, that when you even just look at EVs, for example, and when I said that the federal policy supports are different than they were in the 90s, and they're quite, uh, quite good, but could be stronger, I'll say. Um, you know, the most significant feature of the policy support for EV has been the tax, federal tax credit, which is a $7,500 per car tax credit, it was passed during the Bush administration, you know. So this is not um, necessarily a partisan issue. 